Hello there, welcome to this video lecture on heat integration, pinch technology, minimum number of utilities, minimum number of heat exchangers method, part five, determining the best arrangement of heat exchangers. We have completed all steps in heat integration now and we are at our final step, determining the best arrangement of heat exchangers. This is the longest and most difficult step, so please be patient as you go through this. Remember that the purpose of our cascade diagram was to determine where we had pinch points. And so we determined some very important information from the cascade diagram. We determined that we had to design one set of heat exchangers for blocks A, B, and C because they were above the pinch point. We determined that we needed another set of heat exchangers for block D. We also learned that we need to supplement blocks A, B, and C with 100 kilowatts of heat. Likewise, we need to dispose of 50 kilowatts of heat within block D below the pinch. So before we begin matching hot streams and cold streams, we have to follow some rules. And we're going to begin above the pinch point. There are several rules for matching hot and cold streams above the pinch point, And you have to follow all of them. We first lay out the temperature interval diagram featuring all blocks above the pinch. We do not include any blocks below the pinch. We always start from the bottom block and go up. We transfer heat from the hot side to the cold side, horizontally or diagonally down, but never diagonally up, and we will see why that isn't physically possible. We match hot streams that have the smallest m dot cp delta t first, so in other words, we match hot streams that have the smallest q first and we usually match them with cold streams that have the largest Q, or the largest M dot CP. For streams that touch the pinch point, the M dot CP hot must be less than or equal to the M dot CP cold. If it isn't, then we split the hot stream in half, or thirds, or quarters, whatever we have to do, so that the M dot CP hot is less than or equal to the M dot CP cold. We use hot utilities as soon as possible, but we never violate the rules above. We always prioritize the rules above rule 6. And we remember that the information we determined from the cascade diagram is very helpful. Remember it told us that we would need to supplement above the pinch 100 kilowatts of heat somewhere. So we are going to start laying out our above the pinch matches. Remember that we always start from the bottom when we are working on our heat exchanger design above the pinch. We determine our options for matches first. So working horizontally, we can see that we can match streams 2 and 5, 2 and 6, 3 and 5, or 3 and 6. But remember our rule? We start with the smallest hot stream, which is stream 2. It has the lowest Q and we transfer this to the cold stream with the largest m dot cp. This happens to be stream 5. So our first match is going to be between streams 2 and 5. We're going to check is m dot cp hot less than or equal to m dot cp cold. The m dot cp hot for stream 2 is 2, and m dot cp cold is stream 5, that is 8, so yes m dot cp hot is less than or equal to m dot cp cold. So we start always with the stream that has the smaller q. This is stream 2. So stream 2 has an m dot cp delta t of 2 times 150 minus 100. This is t in minus t out. This is a heat of 100 kilowatts. So we will be transferring 100 kilowatts of heat to stream 5. And we designate this by saying that 100 kilowatts of heat is equal to negative m dot cp delta t. 
And the reason for the negative sign, it's very, very important, is because we are transferring heat between a hot stream and a cold stream. We need that negative sign, otherwise these temperatures are not going to make any sense. So laying this out more clearly here, 100 equals negative 8 times T in minus T out. Remember, we always start from the bottom, so we know T in, we do not know T out. So we solve for T out, it is 102.5. So I designate that with these circles and these lines. Notice that these are not drawn to scale. These are drawn in a way that you can read them. They're not necessarily drawn to scale. So just reviewing what we just did, we set up a heat exchanger to use stream 2 from 150 to 100 to heat up stream 5 from 90 to 102.5. I like to lay out all of these streams, the hot and cold streams, on a graph, a temperature graph, so that I know that these streams are not touching or crossing. Notice that we are not violating our minimum approach temperature of 10 degrees. Let's next look at our possibilities for our next heat exchanger match. So we can transfer heat from stream 3 to 5, or we can transfer heat from stream 3 to 6. But notice if we choose to transfer heat from 3 to 5, we would not be transferring heat horizontally. We would be transferring heat diagonally up, which is not allowed. You cannot use a stream that is 100 degrees centigrade to heat up a stream to 102.5. That physically does not make sense. That cannot happen. So we have to choose the match of 3 to 6. So if we match 3 and 6, is m.cp hot less than or equal to m.cp cold? The m.cp hot is 3, m.cp cold is 4, so yes. So transferring heat from 3 to 6, stream 3 is the smaller stream. It has the smaller m dot cp, so we start with that. 3 times 200 minus 100 is 300 kilowatts of heat that it has to give. We transfer this to stream 6. So stream 6 is a fairly large stream. 300 kilowatts equals negative m dot cp delta t. Its m dot cp is 4. So writing out this equation, we write out 300 equals negative 4 T in minus T out, and we specify T in because we always start at the bottom. So we specify the bottom temperature, and that is 90 degrees. Solving this equation, we get T out is equal to 165. Just reviewing what we did, we set up another heat exchanger. This uses stream 3 from 200 to 100 degrees to heat up stream 6 from 90 to 165. Our temperature graph tells us that we have not violated the minimum approach temperature. These lines are not touching or crossing, which is good. We have set up the heat exchanger correctly. Reviewing where we are and where we need to match streams next, we've exhausted all hot streams at this point except for stream 1. Stream 5 still needs to be heated from 102.5 to 190. Stream 6 needs to be heated from 165 to 190. Note that we cannot transfer heat diagonally up again. Uh, we cannot transfer heat from stream 1 to stream 6. You cannot use a stream that is at 150 degrees to heat up a stream that is at 165 degrees. This makes no sense. You cannot do this. So what this means is that stream 5 has the larger m dot cp anyway, so we should transfer heat from 1 to 5. Is m dot cp hot less than or equal to m dot cp cold? It is not, but this doesn't matter because these streams are not touching the pinch point. So transferring heat from stream 1 to stream 5, stream 5 is the smaller stream, so we calculate its Q first. 
Its Q is 8 times 102.5 minus 190, so this is negative 700 kilowatts. This heat is transferred, or this cooling, I should say, is transferred to the hot side. Whenever you have this transfer of cooling or heating, you use this negative in front of the m dot Cp delta T. So negative 700 kilowatts is equal to negative m dot Cp delta T. This is negative 8 delta T. And remember, we always specify the lower temperature above the pinch, so we know T out. T out is 150, so we can solve for T in. This is 237.5. Reviewing what we just did, we set up another heat exchanger to use stream 1 from 237.5 to 150 to heat up stream 5 from 102.5 to 190. Our temperature graph tells us that we have not violated the minimum approach temperature. These lines are not touching or crossing, so we have designed the heat exchanger correctly. Looking at the next match that we need to make, we need to be cognizant that we have to use our 100 kilowatt hot utility somewhere. Uh, the, our number one priority was to transfer heat horizontally, and we did that very well but now might be a good time to use this 100 kilowatt hot utility. Stream 6 might be a good place for that. Stream 4 still needs to be heated from 190 to 290. So using the hot utility for stream 6, we first calculate how much it requires. 4 times 165 minus 190 means that it requires 100 kilowatts of heat. And that's exactly what the cascade diagram told us we would need. So we set this up with a hot utility. Reviewing what we just did, we set up a heat exchanger to use a hot utility, most likely high pressure steam, to heat up stream 6 from 165 to 190. Just a reminder, low pressure steam is at 160 degrees, medium pressure steam is at 185 degrees, high pressure steam is at 255. And so you might think that using medium pressure steam is a good option for this heat exchanger. However, you cannot use something that is 185 degrees to heat up something that needs to be heated to 190. You cannot use something that is colder than the cold stream requires. So high pressure steam is our only option here. I've set up our temperature graph here and high pressure steam, medium pressure steam, low pressure steam usually come in at one temperature and about 10 degrees cooler at the outlet. That's why I specified 245 for the outlet. And the minimum approach temperature is definitely not violated for this heat exchanger. Reviewing where we are, the last match should be between streams 1 and 4. Because we completely used our hot utility that the cascade diagram predicted, this should be a perfect match in terms of heat. So matching streams 1 and 4, we can calculate the Q for stream 1 or for stream 4. It doesn't matter. They should be exactly the same. The Q for stream 1 is 500 kilowatts. The Q we, we transfer this 500 kilowatts to stream 4, and we specify that it is negative 5 delta T. We solve for T out in this situation because we know T in is 190, and T out is 290. These streams matched perfectly. This is not magic. This is because we prepared and we knew how much heat this above-the-pinch design would require. Reviewing what we just did, this heat exchanger uses stream 1 from 300 to 237.5 to heat up stream 5 from 190 to 290. Our temperature graph shows that we have not violated the minimum approach temperature. So at this point, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that you have successfully designed a heat exchanger network above the pinch.
The bad news is that you still have to design a heat exchanger network below the pinch. And of course, there are certain rules for doing that. So for our blocks below the pinch, for us, this is block D. We lay out the temperature interval diagram featuring all blocks below the pinch. For us, it's only one block. We start from the top and go down. This is different than above the pinch. We transfer heat to the hot, from the hot side to the cold side horizontally or diagonally down, but never diagonally up. This is the same rule as above the pinch. Just as before, we match hot streams that have the smallest m dot cp delta t first. We get rid of hot streams that have the smallest q first. For streams that touch the pinch point, m dot cp hot must be greater than m dot cp cold. If it is not, you have to split the cold stream in halves or thirds or quarters so that m dot cp hot is greater than or equal to m dot cp cold. Prioritizing all these other rules, after that, we use cold utilities as soon as possible. We remember the information we determined from the cascade diagram. The cascade diagram told us that we would need to use 50 kilowatts of cold utility somewhere below the pinch point. So let's look at our below the pinch matches. Below the pinch is comprised only of block D. So we have some options here. We always start from the top. We determine our options for matches as either two to six or three to six. We start with the smallest hot stream. This is stream two. It has the smallest Q. Is M dot CP hot greater than or equal to M dot CP cold? It is not. M dot CP hot is two. M dot CP cold is four. So what this means is that we have to have stream six, so that m dot cp hot is equal to m dot cp cold. So I will do that, and when you do that, your m dot cps are then halved, so these are two and two. Let's start with stream two. It has a Q of 100 kilowatts. It is the smaller stream, so we transfer 100 kilowatts over to stream six. Again, the negative sign is very important. Negative m dot cp delta t equals negative two delta t. Notice the two because we halved this stream. This is the equation with a below the pinch matches. We always start at the top. This means that we specify t out. t out is 90 degrees. So this means t in is 40 degrees. Reviewing what we just did, this heat exchanger uses stream two from 100 to 50 degrees to heat up one half of stream six from 40 to 90. Our temperature graph shows that we have not violated the minimum approach temperature and we have arranged this heat exchanger correctly. Reviewing where we are, half of stream six still needs to be heated. We need to transfer heat horizontally as much as possible. This means that we should try to match streams three and six. Stream six is probably the smaller Q, so we start with that, two times four minus 90. This gives us a heat requirement of negative 100 kilowatts, so we transfer that to stream three. Again, we need to be cognizant of the negative sign here, negative three delta T. We specify T in because we start at the top, so we specify the top temperature. So this means that T out is 66.7. Reviewing what we just did, this heat exchanger uses stream three from 100 to 66.7 to heat up one half of stream six from 40 to 90. Our temperature graph shows us that we have not violated the minimum approach temperature. Let's look at the last step. There are no more cold streams. Stream three needs to be cooled from 66.7 to 50 degrees. And the cascade diagram told us we would need 
50 kilowatts of cooling in this block, so it is time to use that cold utility. Calculating the Q that needs to be accommodated by this cold utility, it's 50 kilowatts. This is what the cascade diagram told us it would be. So we set up this heat exchanger to be cooled with cooling water. This heat exchanger uses a cold utility to cool down stream 3 from 66.7 to 50 degrees centigrade. Just a reminder, cooling water usually enters at 30 degrees centigrade and leaves at 45 degrees centigrade, which is why I set up my temperature graph so that the cooling water is entering at 30 and leaving at 45. And this means that our minimum approach temperature is not violated. These lines are not crossing or touching. We have designed this heat exchanger properly. Putting everything together, it's a little bit messy, but you can see that all streams are matched and everything that needs hot utility has it, everything that needs a cold utility has it. Starting over here with stream six, we use a hot utility for the last part of it. Stream one heats up all of stream four and then it heats up part of stream five. Stream 2 heats up the other part of stream 5, and after that it heats up half of stream 6. Stream 3 heats up stream 6, partially, and then it heats up half of stream 6, after which it is cooled down using a cold utility. If it helps you to understand it better in terms of words, stream six is heated from 165 to 190 using high pressure steam. Stream one heats up all of stream four and then it heats up stream five partially. Stream two heats up stream five partially and then heats up half of stream six. Stream three heats up stream six and then half of stream six and then it's cooled down using cooling water. Let's look at how all of this looks in Aspen. So reviewing our streams, we have one, two, and three. These are all after the reactor. Streams four, five, and six are all before the reactor. So if stream six is heated from 165 to 190 using high pressure steam, I've added a heat exchanger here for that stream and high pressure steam. Next, stream one heats up all of stream four, and then it heats up stream five from 102.5 to 190. This looks like this. Next, stream two heats up stream five from 90 to 102.5, and then heats up half of stream six from 40 to 90. Next, stream three heats up stream six from 90 to 165, then half of stream six from 40 to 90, then is cooled from 66.7 to 50 using cooling water. Looking at both diagrams, we can see here that after we have implemented heat integration, we have one fewer heat exchanger. The heat integrated process is definitely more complex and a little more confusing. However, it saves a lot of money. A very common question that I'm asked is, what do you do when you have more than one pinch point? If you have more than one pinch point, and you probably will, you should use below the pinch rules for the very last zone and above the pinch rules for everything else. What this means, for example, for this cascade diagram that we completed in the previous lecture, we use above the pinch rules for every zone except for the very, very bottom one. 
If you do not follow this, your results will not make sense. And some final, final thoughts now. Heat integration is not gospel, nor is it strictly prescriptive. Remember that we made some very consequential assumptions, such as heat capacity being constant. So the way this works on paper is not necessarily the way it's going to work in Aspen or ChemCAD. More than anything else, do not follow heat integration blindly. Always do what makes sense. If it doesn't make sense to break up a stream into halves, thirds, sixths, etc., then don't do that. Heat integration doesn't know what is cheapest. Heat integration doesn't understand what is most profitable. It is just a tool. Do not use it blindly. Thank you so much for sticking with me, and thank you for being here for this video lecture series.